And my practice focuses in large part on seeing the patients who don't respond to traditional treatments, which is CPAP therapy. But first and foremost, um, sleep apnea is a underdiagnosed condition. It has impact on a lot of what the primary care practitioner will see, everything from heart disease to high blood pressure to diabetes. Um, and so there are a number of things that are really are relevant to the internist on a day-to-day -day basis. And the problem, if I can emphasize any one take-home point about sleep apnea, is that if we're not looking for it, we're missing it. Um, and again, the implications are significant related to the morbidity uh, beyond just sleep. Uh, the good news is there are a lot of new treatments that exist for sleep apnea. Um, I will be highlighting that today in something called upper airway stimulation. That is a sort of a hybrid between the medical and surgical world. It's a surgically implanted device that then medically acts to gently stimulate the airway to open up while patients sleep. Um, and a really incredible new advance in what we can offer a subset of patients with sleep apnea who don't tolerate traditional CPAP therapy. Unfortunately, um, first and foremost, uh, while weight is a huge component for the vast majority of sleep apnea, statistics with weight loss are poor. And so it is very rare that we simply say, hey, lose some weight and we'll talk, um, simply because we know that, the, you know that in general weight loss is difficult, but it's also particularly difficult for the sleep apnea patient who's tired all the time. So it's a, it's a real uphill battle for them. So we really do know, need to go beyond just weight loss. Similarly, unfortunately, tonsillectomy rarely as an adult has benefit. For kids, it's an entirely different animal. Tonsils and adenoids are usually the primary factor inherent in sleep apnea for kids. For adults, it's a pretty rare situation where the tonsils play that role. But there are new advances in terms of anatomy-altering surgery. There used to be this operation called the UPPP. It actually still exists, and many people still do it. But I think we have better operations, more functional, they have less morbidity. And so I think that's really the great thing about sleep apnea treatments. That's, the, that's exactly it. There really is a plan B. And unfortunately, I think what happens is that patients are really told, this is it. CPAP is it. And I think it's really critical to recognize that there is so much more out there now with treatment of sleep apnea. First and foremost, there are things we can do to make CPAP more comfortable, more tolerable. Second, for those patients who simply won't or can't, um, there are medical devices, particularly something called oral appliances, which actually have benefit. There are also devices called EPAP, expiratory positive airway pressure, which is a little, looks like a little band-aid device that works for some people. And then we have surgery, and surgery again has completely changed in terms of what we can offer the patient. And many people are biased that surgery is not the right way to go, in large part because what's out there is UPPP, which has a fairly low success rate. But again, there are better surgeries, they're more reconstructive, less about removing tissue and more about reorienting and reconstructing what is, what is more natural anatomy. And then again, we have this last category, which is what's called upper airway stimulation, which is just a revolution in treatment of sleep apnea. And a really incredible publication last year in the New England Journal of Medicine, which highlighted its efficacy. I think it's more important probably for the sleep medicine physician to know about it, but I think it's also relevant for the primary care physician, because I think they ha they're the ones who are going to see the patients who are coming back routinely who have decided not to use their CPAP. And we need to be asking the questions, are you using your CPAP? Are you are you tolerating it? And when, when they're not, making the appropriate recommendations either one, to help tolerate CPAP, or for that matter, making the appropriate recommendations to find somebody who can give them alternative treatment options. And that's really what, what my job is. It's not, my job is not to, on a day-to-day -day basis, to tell people they need surgery. My job is to lay out all the options that exist and then try to steer them what's gonna, to what's going to work best for them. The, the, there is a, a lot out there in terms of home-based sleep studies. And home-based sleep studies are an area in which patients are often pushed by virtue of the fact that it's a cost saving for the insurer. Um, home-based sleep studies have a lot to be, uh, leave a lot to be desired. They unfortunately tend to underestimate sleep apnea, but they're a reasonable screening tool. Um, they do an okay job of at least identifying the presence of sleep apnea. They may not tell us the severity, but at least identify those patients who suffer from the disorder. So it's not a bad way to go. I think there will be better uh, better means of screening, but, and, and I think they're, they're acceptable. I won't say they're great, but they're acceptable. But when possible, it's always appropriate to send the patients to the lab for the gold standard level one polysomnogram.